I can prove to you that those people didn't want to come here. And this is how we do it. Because until we started bombing their countries, they didn't come. Hey everybody, and welcome to the podcast. Um, I hope you're well. It's, um, let me just adjust this a little loud in my earphones. So, uh, hope you're well. It's really nice here in Ireland this past few days. We've had uh, we've had some great weather, and it's been it's been brilliant because the weather has been fucking shit. Um, this past few weeks. Uh, hope you're all keeping well. I hope you're all corona free. And staying safe and all that shit. Um, just give you a little update with the uh, with the Bonnevilles. It looks like we um, I can't see us gigging this year. Everything just got. Uh, we were supposed to play Stendhal Festival. And they announced yesterday. I think it was next week when they announced that it was cancelled. They were organising some socially distanced version of the festival, and they they pulled the plug on that. But we kind of expected that to happen. I think they were leaving the, to as late as as late as possible before they they made the official announcement. Sorry, just taking a drink of water. So, I can't see the Bonnevilles getting to gig this year, to be honest. And uh, yeah, so there's that. And uh, on my solo album, it's it's gone to be mastered. So I'm really looking forward to hearing that. And I should have a, a release date for you very soon for that. Um, what else? Uh, no, that's just about. That's about it, really. That's about it. Um, so, listen. Today we're going to talk about. I'm going to play you a couple of videos, and we're going to talk about slavery, colonialism, and refugees, and all these things, and the 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 military industrial complex and all that stuff. Um, how these things are all connected. Uh, at the minute in the UK, there's a a, a small uh, number of refugees coming across from Syria, Libya, Afghanistan, and if you were to listen to the to the press in this country, you would you would think it, were, it was being invaded by a couple of hundred per people that haven't got a pot to piss in. But it's very disappointing. But anyway, so here we go. Listen, like, share, subscribe, do the whole thing. Uh, make sure you tell your friends. Get over to the YouTube channel. Hit me up on the YouTube if you're listening to this on your podcast provider. Um, head over to the YouTube, and you can watch me if you fancy that. So this is a video as well. Anyway. Here we go. So I'm going to play you a video from a girl called Ash Sarker. She's she's a member of the Novara Media thing, and uh, she's I don't know if you uh, she was the girl that um, the woman sorry um, that called Piers Morgan out when she says I'm, I'm I'm literally a communist, you idiot. That's her. So she's very good. She triggers the right uh, a lot. And uh, they hate her very, very much. I'm, I, I'm actually very fond of her because she is a, she's a mouthy woman of color, and she is um, very, very intelligent, and she uh, knows her shit. She's actually a lecturer in in economics, I believe, in real life. So she knows her stuff. So she did. She put this little video out uh, during the week about the refugee crisis. So let's have a little watch. It's only short, five minutes, have a listen. You might have heard from Nigel Farage and his merry band of reactionaries that the country is in grave peril. No, not from that. It's from migrants crossing the channel in rubber dinghies you'd consider too flimsy for pootling around Shadwell Basin, let alone navigating the world's busiest shipping channel or carrying women and children. It is pretty dangerous, just the number of people on board that boat. Let me just see, are you okay? Are you all right? They're Syrians who fled a country torn apart by civil war, bailing out a tiny boat with a plastic bucket. 
How do you think they're getting along, Simon? In contrast to the government's hostile environment for migrants, the media has fostered a much more hospitable one when it comes to super dumb opinions about migration. I'd go down the Trump route. Why not have a nice spiky barbed wire fence somewhere down the channel, very rubber dingy, unfriendly. Just, just, just... Uh, what the fuck is, what, 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 what happens in people's fucking heads? That they think that that's okay. Instead of the border I'm force serious. going out and bring them in like a free taxi service, the border force goes out in mid channel and turns everyone round at their cover crop. No one getting on a dinghy in France is desperate. Completely close the borders because it's got to the stage now is there's no education, schooling, infrastructure. It's enough. We are sinking. Ash, are you all right? Yeah, uh, I'll be fine. Just waiting for the tramadol to kick in. Peter Pan. The problem with the establishment. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. I can't. It, it, that, that genuinely fucking upsets me. These people. The, the lack of humanity. The, the, simply the lack of humanity. I mean, j just just take it from that. Look at it from that perspective. It's staggering. It's fucking breathtaking. But. The point is, the hypocrisy is fucking off the chart. Literally off the chart. There's an old saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire because God doesn't trust the British in the dark. I don't know who that's credited to, but it's very true. The British, hearing English people, British people, <clears throat> Complaining about refugees coming from other countries when they had the biggest empire known to man and colonized two thirds of the planet. And here they are, the same, the ancestors of those people, people who are still benefiting from the proceeds for, of that colonization. Stay with me on that one. I'm going to want to talk about this. Colonization. The, the 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 sins of colonization and the 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 profits of colonization didn't end in 1953 whenever Sudan got its independence or uh, in in 1916 with the Easter Rising in Ireland the, that's not the end of it it's not the end of the story you have to understand the the weight of colonization is carried for centuries by the people living after the colonization. Even after the country's got its own independence. We'll talk about that later, but let's stay with this video. Media's macabre and content-free coverage of migrants crossing the channel is that little to no attempt is made to counter much of the bollocks which has become lodged in the deepest recesses of the nation's psyche. Because there's no context, images of brown men in small boats are, no pun intended, floating signifiers. They're seen through the lens of much of the prejudiced, dishonest and alarming coverage which you find in right-wing print and political media. Journalists are failing in their duty to separate fact from popular feeling. Now, a reporter might say that their job is just to neutrally convey what's going on by finding an event and physically pointing at it. This goes hello! But by the time a BBC News or Sky reporter has even put on their life jacket, the plight of migrants at sea has already been reduced to far-right talking points determined by Nigel Farage and given governmental legitimacy by Priti Patel. Journalists have a responsibility to debunk the myths which will inevitably become attached to the images that they generate and distribute. Myths like the UK is uniquely burdened with refugees because other countries are failing to take on their fair share. Pay attention to this. This is important. That we've all heard that, right? This idea that Britain has an un, un has unfairly taken in more, m more sorry taken in more than his first share of refugees not true it's actually the opposite britain isn't even in the top 10 for refugee hosting countries right and see if you say well why should we be britain created half of them britain is a part of this fucking right wing uh, western europe uh, uh, western world domination of the rest of the planet 
Look at this map. Libya, Syria, Iraq, Iran. Just you, you can't see um, Afghanistan. It's all it's 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 on over. Where is okay, is Afghanistan? Uh, well, anyway, just look at the countries in there that I've named. Britain has and and and. Britain has been at war, invaded, sanctioned. It, it has been involved in all manner of horrible things. Yemen, look what's going on in Yemen at the minute. Do you know that there's a fucking crisis? There's a famine being caused in Yemen. Saudi Arabia and a coalition of other Arab countries are bombing Yemen. And it is it is a, um, a sectarian war. Different factions within Islam. And who is Britain's biggest um, customer for arms? You guessed it, Saudi Arabia. So then you get Yemeni refugees turning up in Europe. Some of them make their way to the UK. And then you start mouthing off on fucking TV programs and radio stations and in newspapers and in vox pops on the streets as if... You're being unfairly burdened by 200 fucking refugees turning up from pick any fucking country. Staggering. And in fact, only two countries in Europe, Germany and Turkey, for those of you who are interested, even feature in that list. And that's because 85% of people who are displaced across borders choose to stay in countries neighbouring the one that they just left. We're not even that popular when you compare us to other European countries. Last year, the UK received 44,835 asylum applications. Greece, in comparison, got over 77,000. Spain received over 117,000, France 128,000, and Germany 165,615 asylum applications. Okay, but what about all that stuff about migrants coming over here just to live large off the benefits system and steal all our jobs? Said so I've applied for 100 jobs in a railway. 100 jobs. But these immigrants, they get all their tickets paid for, they get all their jobs. Well, contrary to popular opinion, the fraction of migrants who do want to come to the UK aren't doing it because of our hugely generous benefit system. Asylum seekers aren't even allowed to apply for permission to work in the UK unless they've been waiting on a response to their initial claim for 12 months. Right? You're, you're still with us, aren't you? You understand what she's saying? There, this idea that the benefits... I mean, how much is the benefit? How much is dole? I don't know how much it is, but it's it's fucking pittance, right? It is a fucking pittance. Now, if if you've got... If you say, well, why should... I mean, the argument is, why should any money be paid to... A, when, if, let's say this refugee is coming from Syria, a country that we have destabilised... The way I said the I say we I don't mean me and you I mean the UK. I don't think well okay well, right semantics but we'll we'll go with it. The UK has helped to destabilize Libya, which the UK has helped turn into a failed state is currently at war with itself and it's got three different governments all claiming uh, legitimacy. Right, Libya for all its flaws, for all its flaws and we know it has many and we know I'm not I'm not defending. Colonel Gaddafi, right? It had Libya had the highest quality of life in Africa, and it was it was a, a, a it was a, it was a a functioning country, a functioning economy, until the West went in with the UK, overturned its government, and helped contribute to the assassination of Gaddafi. Now Gaddafi warned the West you don't know what you're doing here. If I go this country will eat itself alive. And that's exactly what happened. And the way he died was unbelievable. It was disgusting. They actually he was filmed and I, I've, I've never I've, I've watched the footage up to the point that they kill him but they're dragging him on the streets and they Bugger, bugger him with a knife to death. 
They rammed the fucking knife up his ass until he dies. That's how they killed the man. And I don't care what you think uh, of him. That's I wouldn't do it to a dog. So the argument goes, why should we take in Libyan refugees after what we did to their con- how, how, wh- where do you get the you go, well why do they walk across Italy and France and Ger- or to get to the UK well maybe they speak English maybe they've got family maybe they've got friends the, there's a connection there for them to come sometimes um, there's a lot of uh, uh, for example, Sudan. Sudan has a lot of uh, people leave Sudan, and a lot of them will go for England because England was the old colonial power. So they speak English, and they've got a historical connection, albeit unwanted, but it's there with the old colony. Same as in Belgium and Italy and France, and where you've got uh, uh, in North Africa, it was colonized large, largely and uh, in large parts by France. So those guys tend to migrate for France and they speak French as a first sometimes as a first language never mind a second language so that's why you would in in the UK you have Nigerians and Kenyans lots of Nigerians and Kenyans who all speak perfect English it's the first language so that's why they would go there so the, the, um, so if you're saying why should they come here after we've de- destabilized their their country well, then you're a fucking idiot. You're, you're just a fucking idiot. If your second part is, why should we be paying for them to be housed? Or why should we be paying for them to be fed? Or why should we, you know... Again, well, then you're a fucking monster. We've destabilized their countries. And this is my point. This is always... Whenever I talk about this subject, this is... I always... I and always inevitably say this. I can prove to you that those people didn't want to come here. And this is how we do it. Because until we started bombing their countries, they didn't come. It's literally as simple as that. It's literally as simple as that. If we can stop bombing these people's fucking countries, interfering with their countries and their their economies and their lives, they won't fucking come. They don't want to come. Some will, and some of us will go other places. But generally, people want to fucking live where they live. And they want to be left alone to do it. Right, let's push on. And many are entitled to just £37 a week to cover food, travel, and other necessities. Sorry, I straight off my point. In Glasgow, yes, that was so, they get £37 a week. So in Glasgow, there was a migrant crisis. Where there was, I think there was a, 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 one of the people that was a migrant, a refugee, an asylum seeker, actually stabbed a few people. But they'd got, they, I think what had happened was they actually went a bit fucking mental in the asylum system. And they used to be given, as she says, £37 something a week, right? But let's face it, you're not going to do much with that. But it meant then that. They could buy a phone card, or they could do, you know, there's a little, there was a little bit of something there for them to do. They could phone home or do whatever. That was taken off, and that was then contracted out to one of these shit com. I don't know which one it was, but it was G4S or Surfco or one of them bastards, and that money went straight to Surfco, and then they took, they then managed that money for the asylum seeker. Right. So, so how does a private company, whenever something is privatised, whenever a public service is privatised, how does the private company make a profit? Remember, the private company, their interest is not to provide the service. Their interest is to make a profit by providing the service. They're not the same thing. Okay? So then the company had to manage the money for the, for, for the refugees. So then they had literally no independence. They had nothing. They, they couldn't choose to buy the thing or do the thing and they got less of the 30 so the 37 pounds the 38 pounds that they that they were awarded the management company took their slice of that and all right so anyway 
And I can absolutely guarantee you that nobody, like nobody, is risking their life or their child's life just to get a fiver a week and centers on the telly. While Nigel Farage has been banging on about migrants being put up in four-star hotels, which just means that there's hot food, private bathrooms and Wi-Fi, asylum seekers have actually been complaining about being assigned to accommodation which is rat infested and unfit for human habitation. The businesses responsible for this accommodation are often companies who've been awarded contracts worth billions by the government. So it's not actually the asylum seekers who are fleecing the system. It's corporations like G4S, Serco and Mins. What commonly brings asylum seekers to the UK is speaking a shared language, having family here already, or the existence of community networks which can help support them as they try and build a life for themselves. It's absolutely not the prospect of getting a complimentary shortbread bicky at a Dover hotel. All right, so what if you accept that asylum seekers should be treated like human beings on principle, but you just think that the UK is too full to accept any more people? According to Inside Housing and Shelter, 2% of English land area is used for golf courses, which is around the same amount of land area which is used for housing. And it's not as if people are going around insisting that the Royal Navy should intervene to stop the scourge of golfers. Although, maybe they should. It's an amazing place and nothing will ever be built around it because I own all the land around it. It's nice to own land. It's certainly true that there's a housing crisis in this country, but that's not because every single habitable building is literally full to the brim with people. According to official data, housing supply has outstripped housing formation every year since 1996. The pro All right, so there we go. So you should check her out, Ash Sarker, and she's a part of the Novara Media thing. And they do great work. I, 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 I'm a big fan of what they do. So, the, so, so this is the whole point. So, let me just get my thing up here. Sorry, bro, with me, bro, with me, bro, with me. Oh yeah, I meant to say as well. I'm sorry I'm taking so long to get to this podcast, but um, I've been very fucking busy doing other things, getting on with life. So. I'm going to read you an article from the Morning Star, and this is the point. This is the whole point. The the, the that simple concept that those vile monsters, and I do think that they are vile monsters. I think they're disgusting individuals. That they that they don't seem to be able to muster their humanity. And feel any element of sympathy for these people, and then if they say, "Well, I do, feel, I do feel sorry for them, but I don't think they should be here." Well, then why do you keep voting for governments that make sure that they're going to keep coming? That's it's very. This is very simple stuff. So, here's an article from the Morning Star. It's written by uh, a woman called Lindsay German, and she is a convener of the Stop the War Coalition. And this article is titled, Asylum Seekers in the Channel, A Humanitarian Crisis of Our Government's Making. And this is exactly the point. So here we go. In the, it's only short. In the past week, we have seen Home Secretary Pretty Patel take to the seas. The Navy called out to the police to police the English Channel. And the BBC and Sky News charter boats to film dinghies full of refugees in distress at sea. There's something very, very, very horrible about that. The mockishness of it. So, all this in response to a few hundred refugees trying to cross the channel in, channel in tiny boats and very dangerous conditions because they are desperate to get to Britain. This has typically been labelled by right-wing media and politicians as akin to an invasion. A YouGov poll showed that nearly half of British people have little or no sympathy for their plight, although figures among Labour voters were, very, were much more favourable. I don't really get much sympathy from that. Tony Blair invaded Iraq. So... The lack of humanity reflects the way asylum seekers and refugees have been demonised and scapegoated by successive governments and large sections of the media. Yet any honest appraisal of the refugee situation would demonstrate that Britain has a legal responsibility to give people fleeing danger 
the protection they need. It would also demonstrate that the refugees are not something separate from British politics and society, but absolutely bound up with it. There was something particularly sickening about the course of condemnation of those arriving on Britain's coast to claim asylum. The refugee, and by the way, there's no such thing as an illegal refu- illegal immigrant, an illegal refugee. You you have you can only claim asylum in the country when you're in the country. So you have to get to the country, then you claim asylum. So the the legal course, the legal path is to get to the country, then claim asylum. Okay, so people saying that they're they're not illegal, they're they're doing what they're supposed to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. The refugees now embarking on this dangerous journeys across the English Channel have crossed half the world to try and reach safety. They come in large part from the Middle East and from Afghanistan. In their majority, in their majority victims, in, in their majority victims of wars waged in those countries, wars in which Britain has played a central part. This is exactly the point. You can't turn around and bomb a country into fucking dust and then complain whenever waves of fucking refugees go for, come to your country looking for safety and comfort what, what, what? why this is not pointed out whenever this is spoken about I mean I'd, I'd, be, I'd be honest with you I've very, I watch very little mainstream media these days very very little I go weeks without watching the news I get all my information um, on, from the internet but whenever you, whenever I do watch it, when they're talking about these subjects, it always staggers me that that's, that issue is never brought up. We don't want Syrian refugees. Well, we should have not fucking bombed Syria five years ago. We don't want Afghanistan refugees. Well, we shouldn't have been at war in their country for almost 20 fucking years. 20 years. There are people going to die in Afghanistan at war in Afghanistan that weren't born when we went to war in Afghanistan when we first went to war in Afghanistan. That's fucking shameful. So more back to the article. More than that, the media and politicians now denouncing them and demanding that military forces deployed to deter them are almost to a man and woman the same people who cheered those wars claiming that they would improve the lives of exactly those people who now attempt this dangerous journey in rubber dinghies it was a lie then and it remains a lie now instead of reporting the disastrous situations in afghanistan iraq and libya All of them countries where regime change was affected by Britain along with its allies. Where the fuck do we get the audacity to go regime change? We're going to change there. Who the fuck are we? Remember what I was talking the other week about whenever you hear uh, these these talking points? Oh, he's a bad guy. He's bad as people. He's doing that. Well, how do you know? Listen to who's telling you this. And listen to the language that they use. That they're stenographers in the press send out into the world and and help perpetrate the, these crimes in the interests of private wealth that's all this is so regime change fuck off um or those con- okay yeah so war Airstrikes, interventions and sanctions, that's my word, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, Wars, airstrikes, interventions and the beginning of occupations are covered in breathless detail, boosted by the military of defence press handouts and endless interviews with military figures. But after the regime has changed, much less is heard for understandable reasons because things do not get better but worse in libya civil war continues the situation in iraq is still dangerous and unstable nearly two decades after the war afghanistan which was invaded 19 years ago remains one of the poorest and most dangerous countries to live in anywhere in the world this coming week peace talks are taking place in doha again between the afghan government and the taliban members spoke about this a few weeks ago the organisation overthrown by the invasion all those years ago. These talks are part of a deal between the US and the Taliban in return for a withdrawal of US troops 
promised by Obama and Trump, which, which, but which has never happened. The deal begs the question, why was it necessary to go through so many years of war and occupation in order to end up in a similar place to 2001? To answer that would pose far too much of a challenge to the BBC and the rest of the media, let alone the politicians who continue to defend their barbaric actions. Could not agree more. You know you're being fucking lied to. And we're teeing up Venezuela for the same treatment for their oil. Bolivia for the, the same treatment for their lithium. Spoke about this last week. Nicaragua uh, for the same... I don't know what it is that, that they have in, in, in Nicaragua that, that so interests the West. But I know that there's a socialist government there and America can't have that. Especially on its own doorstep as it's so... Um, Oh, disgustingly always refers to its, to its southern neighbour but then uh, neighbours <coughs> so okay we're nearly done another paragraph here there are three major legacies of Britain's 21st century interventions the terrible destabilisation of a whole range of countries which whatever their feelings before are in a worse state since western powers invaded or bombed them give me one example where we've done better where we've made things better one one you can't. There isn't one. When we go for these regime change wars, we make it worse. Every single time. Think of it in your lifetime. In your, in your lifetime. Iraq. Afghanistan. Libya. Syria. Venezuela. Bolivia, Nicaragua. That's just off the top of my head. Just literally off the top of my head. And that's, that's not even my lifetime, that's just the past 20 years. The growth of the second thing, the growth of terrorism, and especially the rise of ISIS, which was formed in an Iraqi prison in the British controlled south, which now exists in a number of countries across the world. The creation of millions of refugees who have lost homes and livelihoods through war resulting in environmental change and widespread instability most refugees don't get very far they're in pakistan jordan or other countries neighboring the war zones only a minority get to europe these legacies are the responsibility of countries like britain and any civilized country those who justify and perpetrate those wars should also have to be held accountable for them and they never are that's what makes me sick. You can lie, steal, cheat and even kill. As long as you do it at the behest of the establishment. And if you get caught, keep your fucking mouth shut. The worst that will ever happen to you, you, you will only ever get promoted sideways. The worst. Pretty Patel. Perfect example. Woman should be in jail. She's now our home secretary. The legacies are those are responsible. So, okay. so, the legacies are the responsibility of countries like Britain. In any civilized country, those who justify and perpetrate these wars should also have to be held accountable for them. The costs of welcoming and caring for the refugees are minimal compared with the costs of even a very short war. If we are to use navy boats, it should be to protect them, not to force them back. And their arrival should not be the cause of outrage and fury. But the basis for an examination of why those wars were wrong and how we can end them. We should not be scapegoating those whose livelihoods we have put at risk. Instead we should show our solidarity while making clear that the wars are not here today and gone tomorrow. But having lasting consequences for millions of people. This is it. This is exactly it. I'm going to read that again. These legacies are responsibility of countries like Britain. In any civilized country, those who justify and perpetrate those wars should also have to be held accountable for them. Tony Blair is a war criminal. War criminal should be in jail. George W. Bush is a war criminal should be in jail not yucking it up with Ellen 
on daytime TV. According to Noam Chomsky, every president after World War II is a war criminal and t- 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 with, if, t- with a strict interpretation of the readings of the, the Geneva Convention, they're all war criminals, even Jimmy Carter. The costs of welcoming and curing for the refugees are minimal compared with the costs of even a very short war. If we are to use Navy boats, it should be to protect them, not force them back. Their arrival should not be the cause of outrage, plastic-faced fucking bags given off on fucking TV. But the basis for an examination of why those wars were wrong and how we can end them, we should not be scapegoating those whose livelihoods we have put at risk. Instead, we should show solidarity while making clear that the wars are not here today and gone tomorrow, but having lasting consequences for millions of people. This is exactly the fucking point. This is exactly it. This is the problem with this the, the, this Western colonization mindset that we still have. We still have that. We still think it, we have the right to go into someone else's country and take their stuff. I don't. Obviously. And, and I'm, you probably don't. But there's enough people fucking do. And the ones that don't aren't l- making the ones that do Hey. Right, so I'm going to show you another little video just to if, if you still are disagreeing with this with me. I'm, I'm not appealing, hopefully, to your humanity with this one. So, this is a video of a boat capsizing. These people were from Libya. There's 500, over 500, on a wooden fishing boat which capsized, trying to cross the Med. Now, thankfully, thank God, the Italian Navy were nearby and they rescued pretty much most of them. All but five of the refugees died. Now, these people are desperate. How... How... How how can we, first of all, blame them for, for something? We go into their countries and we bomb them into dust. We destabilize them. And I'm not going to say, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not doing this. This talk, We know that Colonel Gaddafi wasn't a nice guy, you know, Bashir al assad and I, I'm not saying that. And you shouldn't either. Talking points. They're CIA fucking talking points. They get you to say that you're, you're on the path to justify what they do. And they don't do it for goodness. They don't do it because they care about these people. As the lady in the article pointed out every single time we go into these countries and do these things we make it worse for who exactly these people the people that we claim to be wanting to help so we cheerlead on these wars those same people that were that were on the the ash sarker video the, the nigel farage apostles that would be complaining about these refugees Fleeing a war in a country that we fucking started so that our capitalists can make money. The military industrial complex, that's what this is about. It's about controlling resources, it's about selling weapons. And that they would complain that these people would flee that to try and provide a better life for themselves and their families and that they they, they don't feel any empathy or sympathy or responsibility for having caused this in the first place and these are the people that you hear on the TV 
and our politicians will queue up to go and destabilize or commit a regime change or whatever language has that has been um has come from some think tank that the media will then spew out and we will all be walking around saying it like like good little fucking robots without thinking about what it is that we're saying and what we're agreeing what we're agreeing to by the simple fact that we're not by, by not opposing it being neutral isn't enough you can't you can't be neutral you can't just say well, well i don't know you can't be neutral you need to understand what it is you're doing the next country that comes along that we're going to go and destabilize replace the word regime change with destabilize Re- when they say regime change go think to yourself who or am i who are we to regime change anybody despite what we may think our f- we're hypocrites our fucking biggest ally in the middle east is saudi arabia they crucify people in the town fucking square. They cut the heads off witches and wizards. Still to this day. Still to this day. Saudi Arabia do that. Being a wizard is a thing. It's a, it's a crime. And they will decapitate you in public. They still crucify people. They are currently cr- committing a genocide in Yemen. Because another sect of Islam is in charge down there. There's an they've embargoed the country. They're committing a siege, what's what's called a siege warfare, which is illegal under the uh, the tenets of the Geneva Convention. You're not allowed to commit. You're not allowed siege warfare because that's a that's a tactic from the Middle Ages. It basically means starving people to death, and that's what they're doing in Yemen, along with bombing. Who's the biggest customer? For uh, uh, British made uh, weaponry. Saudi Arabia. So they're fine. They're our ally. They're the good guys. Makes me fucking throw up. We need to. We, we, we need. We, we need. To stop doing these things. And I don't know who the next country is. That's that's going to be teed up. By the By the British. I can't. I, the thought that this would happen again, and it's not just the British. The French are at it. The, the Yanks are at it. There's very few. There's very few countries with without, with no blood on their hands. But here's to my, my other point. Why is this so dangerous? Well, you know why it's so dangerous. People die. Their lives are lost. Their livelihoods are lost. But I think it goes deeper than that. It goes. It's more than that. What's lost is the hope and opportunities for generations to come. Quite often centuries to come. These actions that we do today have an echo through time. And it doesn't end when the president is changed or the prime minister is changed. It doesn't end whenever you die or I die of old age. The things that we are doing today will still affect the people in those countries that we do them in in 100 years, in 200 years, in 400 years. Sometimes in very dr- vast and dramatic ways and in other 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 ways not so much but they they will exist and they they do carry on they don't go away whenever you get your independence so, so for example with col- with colonialization sudan was it's got its independence in 1953 sudan is still at war to this day it's never known a moment's peace Ireland it was we've been colonized by the British for 800 years more or less 400 years for cer- for certain the big thing 
the big historical echo that we have, although there are many, is the famine. The population of Ireland in 1942 was 8.2 million. Five years later, 2 million less. The famine was over, so therefore we start to recover, don't we? No, that's not what happens. By the 1890s, the population of Ireland was down to 4 and a bit million from a high of 8.2 million, so almost half of the country it was it was a million dead and a million fled is the old saying. So that's, but that's only during the time of the famine, the f- that short few years. And again, that word famine, we know that there was no famine. But the echoes of what, of that massive change, that massive shift, it continues, it carries on. And in this case, in Ireland's case, it carried on, for, j- just in that example, for 50 years before Ireland's population stabilised at almost half of what it was in the 1840s. Do you get what? Do you get the point I'm trying to make here? So, what we do today will have echoes for generations and sometimes centuries to come. Look at Afghanistan. Can you honestly say that Afghanistan is going to be better in your lifetime? How the fuck could it? How could it? It's impossible. It's literally impossible. So, when we, when the, Libya, Libya was a, was a, was a, oh God, the word escapes me. Um, Libya was a functioning country. Now, it may not be your idea of a functioning country, or my Id- ideal of a functioning country, but I don't live in my ideal of a functioning country. So should, so, so, so should I cheer on a regime change here? A violent regime change here? No, I shouldn't, because that's, obviously dangerous and, and and the wrong thing to do so why would it be right to do it somewhere else can you dig what I'm saying can you get my point that whole thing with colonialize that colonialize colo- colonializing brain that we have in the West and we do suffer from this we have an arrogance it's all based around capitalism it's all rooted in capitalism we think we can go and take other people's shit. And our media play along and this 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 sell the language that's decided upon by these people. The sell it to us, the triangle of terror, regime change. Terrorist. What is a terrorist? A very simple thing. What is a terrorist? Do you think the people in Iraq think they're terrorists, or did they, would you, the the American soldier kicking in their front door in the middle of the night and dragging their their brother, father, uncle, mother, daughter, sister out into the street by the hair, taken to a prison in Abu Ghraib and tortured? Or sent to Guantanamo Bay, which still exists, and has prisoners in there that will never see the light of day. They'll never be free. They will die in there. Who's the terrorist? America currently sanctions 30 countries in the world. Iran, North Korea, Syria, Sudan, Cuba, Venezuela, Belarus, Burundi, Central African Republic, China, Comoros, Democratic Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Eritrea, Hong Kong, Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, Mauritania, Myanmar, Nicaragua, Papua New Guinea, Russia, Somalia, South Sudan, Turkmenistan, Ukraine, Venezuela, Yemen and Zimbabwe. The combined populations of those country, of those countries is two billion people. That's one quarter of the world's population currently under sanctions. Sanctions kill. 
sanctions cause death to happen. It's war by another name. That's all it is. And all the things that we do, that, and I, I use the word we, it's not for me. Obviously, I, and you have no say in these matters, but we need to be aware of what's going on and we need to be alert to to the language that's used to coerce us, to, to, to offer a, a, an approval, be it tacit or otherwise, for the acts that these people commit. And every time that we don't speak out whenever we have an opportunity to, we are agreeing to letting these things happen. And we need to understand that we're being brainwashed constantly to use the language of these people, the language that they want us to use. Whenever they hear you say, oh, I, I, I know but Fidel Castro's a bad man, Somebody's done their job. Somebody's made you use that language and you've done it. Every time you use the word like George Bush triangle of terror and everyone I don't even say it, oh the triangle of terror. Cuba, North Korea and Iraq, wasn't it? North Korea. What do we think of him? There's a good example. There's a little mental exercise for you. What do you think of him? What do you think of North Korea? All the things that I've been telling you, apply it to North Korea now. That wee weirdo, that wee guy. Think of all the things that have been dripped into your ear by the Western media. To, to what, what do you think of him? He's a violent, brutal dictator that murders people. Shoots, I've heard him. He, he, he has people that he dislikes tied to the front of cannons and I'm blown away. Yeah, I've heard that. And then six months later, that same person that was supposed to have been killed turns up at a fucking at a at a at a, at a political rally in Seoul or wherever. But they never mention, oh yeah, we did tell you that they killed him. He obviously hasn't. That happens all the time. The war games that South Korea and the U.S. um the war games that they play in the Sea of Japan off the coast of North Korea. That's that's the causation of a lot of tension. So North Korea is now trying to build an inter intercontinental missile and they keep firing it towards Japan as, as they're practicing doing these things. They're bad people for doing that, aren't they? F firing missiles across the sea in a threatening manner to Japan. Because what they're saying is, if you don't back off, we're going to hit Japan with a missile. That's a very bad thing to do, isn't it? What are the war games that South Korea and the US are doing? P playing, as they say, playing in the Sea of Japan off the coast of North Korea. What is it that they're trying to do? They're practicing invading North Korea right in front of them. They can see what they're doing. And they're doing it. They're doing it to garner a response. They... they they want a response. They want to keep up this cold war with this 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 cold war with with North Korea. So these people are practicing invading your country. Put yourself in their position. If it was some other country off the coast of your country, literally playing a war game, practicing how to invade your country in front of you, would you get a bit pissy? Damn fucking right you would. Don't say it. He's a bad guy. Is he? We're tasting haircuts. That's all I know. All the rest of it. It's all bullshit. I don't know what he is. He might be. I don't fucking know. He might be a nice man. He might not exist. <clears throat> That's going down a conspiracy rabbit hole there, but we're not, which I'm not going to do. So, there we go. That's what I'm going to call this. So... Whenever uh, I I just want uh, the, the the point of this, uh, when I, whenever whenever you're seeing these foreign policies being played out by our governments, you need to be more questioning, and you need to understand you're being groomed by the use of language. The press don't report the facts; they take the Ministry of Defence press releases and literally cut and paste them and call them an article and I, I've seen it I'm sure you have too where you could read almost exactly the same thing in various newspapers 
sometimes across the world. You'll, see, you'll read it in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Times of London, and the Guardian. Almost the same thing. So they've obviously all come from the same source. They cheerlead on these fucking wars and these regime change things that create these poor waves of ref- these waves of poor refugees, most of which don't get to us. Most of which, as pointed out, 87%, 80 odd percent, whatever it was, go to the country that neighbouring the the region that, that's that's got the trouble in it. And yet no. And we cause these these uh, wars and these disturbances. We create these refugees and then we complain without thinking that they're our responsibility, that we caused them in the first place, so therefore they're our responsibility now. It's disgusting. And you're not, you're, you're, you're not going to get these arguments on the BBC. You're not going to get them on ATV. You're not going to get them on Sky. So it's for you to make them to eat with your friends and your family whenever you get an opportunity to. So there we go. Okay, I'm going to call this. So, uh, I was going to do a record recommends. I actually asked Chris to give me them this week. But, um, he, uh, God love him. He's been, you know, he's just, had, him and Shelley have just had another baby. And he's been run ragged. <laughs> he hasn't even admitted it to himself. So, I've, I've sent him the message asking him for the recommends for today's podcast. And, uh, today's podcast... And he hasn't got back to me, <laughs> so it's not like him. He's very on the ball with replying to things usually, but recently not so much. You could be waiting days to get a response. I do feel sorry for him though. So maybe the next podcast I'll get Chris to. Chris will be so kind as to give us a, a wee record recommends. And if anybody, any of you guys, if you just want to send me something, a wee record recommend, send me a list of four records and a wee photograph of yourself, and uh, I. I'd recommend them for you. What about that? Is that a good idea? I right, maybe we could do that more often. That would be good. So, uh, yep. So, I'm going to call it, everybody. Do the thing on the screen here. Can you see? Like, share, subscribe. Where am I? Over here. Yeah, like, share, subscribe. Come and visit me on Twitter and on Instagram and on YouTube, most importantly. Um, And, uh, yeah, hope you have a good weekend. I'll see you at the next one. Take care. <laughs>